Welcome, friend. Come in, come in. You're just in time. I was about to open the book. Which book, you ask? The book of tales that will chill you a little and thrill you a little. I know how much you enjoy these stories as you drift off to sleep. Now turn your light off, lie back, as we journey together into darkness. Pleasant dreams. He will follow you. I stood on the porch of Bob and Helen's house, the late afternoon sun casting long shadows across the overgrown lawn. The paint on the front door was peeling, and newspapers piled up on the stoop hinted at weeks of neglect. I'd been calling them for days with no response. Something was wrong. Bob? Helen? I called out, knocking firmly. Silence answered. Worry not at me. We'd been friends for years and it wasn't like them to vanish without a word. I tried the door handle. It turned easily. Pushing the door open, I stepped inside. The air was stale, carrying a faint musty odor. The house was eerily quiet, the only sound the distant ticking of a clock. Furniture sat undisturbed, but a layer of dust suggested no one had been here for some time. Hello. I ventured further inside, my footsteps echoing on the hardwood floor. As I entered the living room, I noticed a leather-bound diary lying open on the coffee table. Intrigued, I picked it up. Bob's neat handwriting filled the pages. Perhaps this would offer some clue. Settling into an armchair, I began to read. March 3rd. Helen and I stumbled upon an old southern mansion today during our drive through the countryside. It was magnificent, even in its decay. Tall columns, intricate woodwork, an echo of a bygone era. Helen was eager to take photos for our architecture blog. As we explored the grounds, we noticed a stone building set apart from the main house. It was constructed of gray stone, windowless, and strangely pristine compared to the dilapidated mansion. What's that? Helen asked, pointing. Let's find out, I replied. The door was ajar, the lock broken. Inside, the air was cool and still. In the center stood a sarcophagus, its surface carved with unfamiliar symbols. A chill ran down my spine. This must be a mausoleum, Helen whispered. I nodded, feeling uneasy. Above the doorway, an inscription caught my eye. If you enter here, into the realm of death, I shall follow you and bring him with me. An old man appeared behind us. A caretaker, perhaps. His eyes were deep-set, his expression stern. You shouldn't be here, he said flatly. Sorry, we didn't mean any harm, I replied. He won't like it, the man warned. The one who sleeps here, they call him the guest that walks. Those who disturb his rest, he follows them and he brings death with him. A sense of dread settled over me. Are you saying he'll haunt us? The caretaker's gaze didn't waver. Leave this place. Forget you were ever here. March 4th. Back at the hotel, we tried to shake off the encounter. Helen laughed nervously. Just a local legend to scare trespassers. Probably I agreed, but doubt lingered. That night, footsteps echoed in the hallway outside our room, slow, deliberate. I peered through the peephole. The corridor was empty. Did you hear that? Helen whispered. Probably just another guest, I assured her. But when we checked with the front desk in the morning, they said no one else was on our floor. March 5th. We decided to leave town, heading north to put distance between us and that place. Yet the feeling of being watched persisted. At a roadside diner, a stranger approached our table, a gaunt man with piercing eyes. He knows where you are, he said before walking away. Who was that? Helen asked, her face pale. I don't know, I replied, unsettled. That night, at a motel miles away, we heard the footsteps again, closer this time. In the darkness, a shadow moved outside our window, a tall figure with eyes that seemed to glow. March 10th. No matter how far we traveled, the presence followed. Messages appeared, notes slipped under doors, whispers in the night. Helen grew increasingly anxious. Sleep evaded us. Maybe we should go home, she suggested. Maybe you're right, I conceded. March 15th. Home at last. Familiar surroundings brought some comfort. For a few days, the eerie phenomena ceased. We began to relax, thinking perhaps we'd left it behind. March 20th. Tonight, as we prepared for bed, the footsteps returned, 
ascending the stairs slowly, methodically. Bob, Helen's voice trembled. I grabbed a baseball bat from the closet. Stay here. I crept into the hallway. The air was thick, oppressive. The footsteps stopped abruptly. I checked each room. Nothing. Returning to the bedroom, I found Helen staring at the window. He's outside, she whispered. I looked but saw only darkness. We need help, I said. March 21st. Our friend Gary came over after I told him everything. You sure it's not stress? He asked gently. I'm telling you, something is following us, I insisted. That evening, the three of us sat in the living room. At night approached, and the atmosphere grew heavy. Then, the footsteps began, downstairs this time. Gary's eyes widened. You hear it too? Helen asked. He nodded. Stay here. We followed him as he moved cautiously toward the basement door. It stood ajar, a cold draft seeping through. Who's there? Gary called out. Silence. He flicked on the light. The stairs descended into darkness as the bulb flickered and died. Wait here, I said, grabbing a flashlight. As I shone the beam down the steps, a shadow darted out of sight. Did you see that? Helen gasped. Maybe we should call the police, Gary suggested. What will we tell them? I countered. That a ghost is haunting us. March 22nd. We tried to carry on with our lives, but the occurrences escalated. Objects moved on their own. Whispered voices echoed through empty rooms. Helen grew paler by the day. I can't take this anymore, she cried. We'll figure it out. I promised, though I felt helpless. March 25th. Desperation drove me to research. I scoured libraries and the internet for any information on the guest that walks. An old newspaper article caught my eye. A report from 1892 about a man named Thomas Gray, who lived in that mansion. Accused of dark rituals, he vanished under mysterious circumstances. Locals believed he lingered between worlds. I showed Helen. This must be him. How do we stop it? She asked. I don't know, I admitted. March 28th. We decided to confront the entity. That night, we lit candles and sat in the living room. Thomas Gray, we know who you are, I called out. We apologize for disturbing your rest. Please leave us in peace. The candles flickered violently. A cold wind whipped through the room, extinguishing the flames. A voice echoed a deep, guttural whisper. You cannot escape. Helen clutched my arm. What do we do? Maybe we need to return to where it began, I suggested. She shook her head vehemently. No, I won't go back there. March 30th. Sleep deprived and haunted, we grew desperate. Helen's health deteriorated. She spent most of her time in bed, plagued by nightmares. I decided to seek help from a medium, Mrs. Reynolds, known for her expertise in the supernatural. After hearing our story, she agreed to visit. April 2nd. Mrs. Reynolds arrived, her demeanor serious. She walked through the house, eyes closed, sensing the energy. This presence is strong, she said. It has attached itself to you. How do we remove it? I asked. She shook her head slowly. It's not that simple. You trespassed into his domain. He believes you belong to him now. Helen began to sob. Please, there must be a way. There is a ritual, Mrs. Reynolds conceded. But it is dangerous. Whatever it takes, I insisted. She instructed us to gather specific items, candles, sage, personal belongings, and to prepare for the ritual at midnight. At night. We sat in a circle, candles casting a dim glow. Mrs. Reynolds began chanting softly, burning sage to cleanse the space. At first, nothing happened. Then, the temperature dropped sharply. The flames of the candles turned blue. Stay focused, Mrs. Reynolds urged. A shadow formed in the center of the circle, a tall figure with hollow eyes. Why do you disturb me? The entity hissed. We seek forgiveness, I said firmly. We meant no disrespect. You entered my realm, it growled. You cannot undo what has been done. Helen cried out as the entity moved toward her. Protect us. I shouted to Mrs. Reynolds. She began chanting louder, but the entity seemed unaffected. Your rituals cannot banish me, it sneered. The candles extinguished simultaneously, plunging the room into darkness. In the chaos, I heard Helen scream, then darkness engulfed me. April 3rd. I awoke on the floor, disoriented. The morning sun filtered through the curtains, 
Mrs. Reynolds was gone. Helen? I called out. No response. I searched the house frantically. She was nowhere to be found. My phone rang. It was Mrs. Reynolds. I'm sorry, she said softly. So very sorry. There's nothing more I can do. What happened? Where is Helen? I demanded. She's gone, Mrs. Reynolds replied. He has taken her. No, I roared, throwing the phone against the wall. Despair engulfed me. I collapsed, sobbing. April 4th. I refuse to believe Helen is gone. There must be a way to bring her back. I've decided to return to the mansion. If I confront him there, maybe I can bargain for her soul. April 5th. Before leaving, I found this diary and decided to document everything. If I don't make it back, perhaps someone will read this and understand. At this point, the entries ended abruptly. I closed the diary, my hands trembling. The weight of Bob's words settled heavily on me. What had they gotten themselves into? I stood up, intending to call the authorities, when a floorboard creaked above me. I froze. Bob, I called hesitantly. No answer. I rationalized that old houses make noises, but an uneasy feeling gnawed at me. As I moved toward the front door, footsteps echoed from the hallway slow, deliberate, matching the description in Bob's diary. I quickened my pace, reaching for the doorknob. The footsteps grew louder, descending the stairs. My heart pounded in my chest. I yanked the door open and stumbled onto the porch. Just as I was about to step outside, a whisper brushed against my ear. You shouldn't have come here. I spun around. No one was there. Panic surged through me. I dashed to my car, fumbling with the keys. As I started the engine, I glanced back at the house. In an upstairs window, a shadowy figure stood watching, with eyes that seemed to glow faintly. I didn't wait to find out more. Tires screeching, I sped away. But as I drove down the deserted road, the unsettling thought occurred to me. Was I being followed? In the rearview mirror, I thought I saw a dark shape keeping pace with the car, but every time I looked directly, there was nothing. My mind raced with unbelievable thoughts. How could any of this be happening? Suddenly my phone buzzed, startling me. I looked down at it. It was Bob calling. I hit the brakes hard and the car screeched to a halt. I grabbed the phone. Bob. Bob, where are you? I cried. What have you done? There was a strange crackling on the line and supernatural cacophony of sounds that sent shivers down my spine. Then I heard it. A voice. A rasping, unearthly voice that whispered, He knows where you are. Trick or Treat The chill of the October night seeped through James's thin costume, a hastily assembled pirate outfit complete with a plastic sword that dangled awkwardly from his belt. The Halloween party at his friend Mark's house had been lively, filled with laughter, loud music, and the warm glow of jack-o'-lanterns. But now, as he made his way home through the deserted suburban streets, a sense of unease began to creep in. Leaves crunched underfoot as he walked beneath the canopy of skeletal trees. The neighborhood, so familiar by day, transformed under the cloak of darkness. Shadows stretched and twisted, playing tricks on his eyes. Houses adorned with cobwebs, tombstones, and eerily glowing decorations loomed on either side, their silent facades giving nothing away. James checked his watch. 12.15 a.m. Should have accepted that ride, he muttered, pulling his jacket tighter around himself. But the crisp air had seemed inviting after the stuffy confines of the party and besides, it was only a twenty-minute walk. As he turned onto Maple Street, he noticed a solitary figure ahead, a child by the looks of it, wearing a faded clown costume. The oversized shoes and frayed ruffles looked like they belonged to another era. The child's back was to him, standing motionless under the flickering streetlight. Strange, James thought. What was a kid doing out alone at this hour? He approached cautiously. Hey, buddy, shouldn't you be home by now? He called out. The child didn't respond. James felt a prickling sensation at the back of his neck. He considered crossing the street to avoid any awkward interaction, but something compelled him to slow his pace instead. As he drew nearer, he noticed the clown's head tilt ever so slightly, as if acknowledging his presence. Are you okay? 
James asked, his voice betraying a hint of nervousness. Silence. He was close enough now to make out more details. The costume was threadbare, stained with what looked like dirt. Or was it something else? The wig atop the clown's head was missing patches of hair, and the pale white makeup on the visible skin was cracked and peeling. James swallowed hard. Look, if you're lost, I can help you find your way home. The clown turned slowly to face him. The face was obscured by shadow, but the eyes, dark sunken pits, seemed to bore into his soul. A crooked smile stretched across the clown's face, revealing teeth that were unnaturally sharp. James took an involuntary step back. All right, then. Happy Halloween, he stammered, moving past the clown with hurried steps. As he walked away, he could feel the child's gaze burning into his back. He resisted the urge to look over his shoulder, focusing instead on the path ahead. The sound of his own footsteps seemed unnaturally loud in the quiet night. He turned onto Birch Avenue, relieved to put some distance between himself and the unsettling figure. The houses here were larger, set back from the road behind wrought iron fences and meticulously trimmed hedges. The decorations were more elaborate. Ghosts swinging from tree branches, mechanical witches cackling on porches. James allowed himself to relax a little. Just a kid trying to be creepy, he thought. It's Halloween, after all. He pulled out his phone to check for messages. The screen glowed brightly in the darkness, but there was no signal. Great, he muttered. The streetlights above flickered, casting intermittent shadows that danced at the edges of his vision. A rustling sound caught his attention. He paused, straining to listen. It was probably just the wind in the trees. He shook his head and continued walking. Then he heard it again, a shuffling, dragging noise coming from behind him. James's heart began to pound. He glanced back over his shoulder. The clown was there, standing at the end of the street, partially obscured by mist. The child's head was cocked to one side as if amused. How did he get here so fast? James whispered. A wave of fear washed over him. He picked up his pace, walking briskly now. The noise persisted, growing louder. It wasn't just behind him. It seemed to echo from all around. He broke into a jog, his breath coming in short bursts. The streetlights ahead began to flicker more intensely, some of them sputtering out entirely. Calm down, he told himself. You're just spooking yourself. But the shuffling noise was unmistakable now, accompanied by a faint, raspy giggle. James dared another glance back. The clown was closer, much closer, and no longer alone. Flanking the child were other figures, children in tattered costumes, their faces obscured by shadow and grime. Their movements were unnatural, jerky as they advanced down the street. Panic surged through him. He sprinted forward, the plastic sword at his side slapping against his leg uselessly. The houses blurred as he raced past them, his only thought to get away. He veered onto Pine Street, lungs burning, but the street seemed longer than he remembered. The end was shrouded in darkness, the familiar landmarks erased. A shrill laugh pierced the air followed by the pitter-patter of many feet. They're chasing me, James realized with horror. He pushed himself harder, muscles screaming in protest. Ahead, a narrow alleyway offered a potential escape. Without hesitation, he darted into it, the walls closing in on either side. The alley was littered with trash bags and discarded furniture. He stumbled over a broken chair, catching himself against the damp brick wall. The footsteps behind him grew louder, more frenzied. Desperate, James spotted a fire escape ladder just within reach. He leaped, fingers grasping the cold metal rung. With a grunt, he pulled himself up, climbing as fast as he could. Below, the children gathered at the mouth of the alley, their faces turned upward. The clown stood directly beneath him, that eerie smile never wavering. Why are you doing this? James shouted down. The only reply was that raspy giggle now joined by others a chorus of chilling laughter that echoed off the alley walls. He reached the rooftop, scrambling over the ledge. The city stretched out before him, a maze of buildings and blinking lights. For a moment, he allowed himself to breathe. Think, James, think, he whispered. 
There was a door leading into the building. He tried the handle, locked. Of course. Behind him a thud signaled that someone, or something, had reached the roof. He turned slowly. The clown stood there alone this time, the wind whipping the tattered edges of the costume. The child's eyes were black voids, absorbing all light. This isn't real, James said shakily. You're not real. The clown took a step forward. James backed away until he felt the low wall at the edge of the roof press against his spine. Stay back. The clown extended a gloved hand, pointing at him. The fingers elongated unnaturally, nails sharpening into claws. Without thinking, James drew the plastic sword from his belt and brandished it defensively. I I'll fight you! A mocking laugh escaped the clown's lips. James's mind raced. The neighboring building was close. If he could jump across, maybe he could find another way down. He glanced at the gap, a good six feet, with a four-story drop between. Behind him, the clown advanced steadily. Better than the alternative, he decided. Taking several steps back to gain momentum, James sprinted toward the edge and leaped. Time seemed to slow as he soared through the air, arms flailing. He landed hard on the other roof, rolling to absorb the impact. Pain shot through his ankle. He struggled to his feet, biting back a cry. The ankle was twisted, but he could still move. He looked back. The clown stood at the edge of the first building, watching him. Then, with a fluid motion, the child stepped off the roof, plummeting downward. James rushed to the ledge, peering over. There was no body, no sign of impact, just the empty alley below. A sense of dread filled him. What is going on? A door behind him creaked open. He spun around. An elderly man in a bathrobe stood there, confusion etched on his face. What are you doing up here? This is private property. Relief flooded James. Please, sir, you have to help me. There's someone, something, chasing me. The man's expression softened slightly. Calm down, son. You're hurt. James limped toward him. We need to get inside. Lock the doors. The man nodded slowly. All right, come in. They descended the stairs into a dimly lit corridor. The building was old, the wallpaper peeling, the air musty. What's your name? the man asked. James. Thank you for helping me. Name's Harold. You live around here? Not far. I was walking home when... He trailed off, unsure how to explain. Harold eyed him carefully. When what? James hesitated. I know this sounds crazy, but a group of kids, or creatures, started chasing me. They weren't normal. Harold's gaze hardened. Halloween brings out all sorts. They reached the ground floor. Harold led him into a small apartment cluttered with antique furniture and stacks of newspapers. Sit down, he said, gesturing to a worn sofa. I'll get you some water. James sank into the cushions, his body aching. He listened as Harold moved about the kitchenette. Do you have a phone I can use? James called out. Phone's dead, came the reply. Lines have been down since the storm last week. James rubbed his temples. Of course. Harold returned with a glass of water and a damp cloth. Here, for your ankle. Thank you. James took a sip, the water cool and refreshing. He wrapped the cloth around his swollen ankle. So, tell me more about these kids, Harold prompted, taking a seat opposite him. James recounted the events, feeling a bit foolish as he heard himself speak. I know it sounds insane, but they weren't... human. Harold nodded slowly. You're not the first to see them. James looked up sharply. What do you mean? The old man sighed. There are stories, legends really, about lost souls that wander these parts on Halloween night. Children who met untimely ends, seeking vengeance or perhaps just someone to join them. A chill ran down James's spine. That's just folklore, is it? Harold's eyes bore into him. Many have vanished over the years, always on this night. James shook his head. I just want to get home. Harold stood up. I can show you a way out, but you must be careful. James struggled to his feet. Lead the way. They exited the apartment into a back hallway that James hadn't noticed before. The lights flickered ominously. This building connects to an old service tunnel, Harold explained. It'll take you close to your neighborhood. They reached a heavy metal door. 
Harold produced a rusty key and unlocked it. Are you sure about this? James asked, peering into the darkness beyond. It's the safest path, Harold assured him. James took a deep breath and stepped through the doorway. The air was damp and cold. He turned to thank Harold, but the door clanged shut behind him. Hey! He banged on the door. Harold! Silence. A faint scraping sound echoed through the tunnel. James's heartbeat quickened. He fumbled in his pocket for his phone, using its dim light to illuminate the passage. The tunnel stretched ahead, the walls covered in graffiti and mold. Water dripped from unseen pipes. He limped forward, the sound of his footsteps magnified in the confined space. Then he heard it, a whisper, barely audible. James! He spun around, the phone's light revealing nothing but the empty tunnel behind him. Who's there? He called out, his voice shaking. Join us! The whisper came again, from ahead this time. He backed away, panic rising. The light flickered on his phone, the battery draining rapidly. No, 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 he muttered, tapping the screen. The light went out. Darkness enveloped him. He felt a presence nearby, the air growing colder. Help me, he shouted, stumbling backward. A hand grasped his shoulder. He screamed, wrenching himself free. In the pitch black, he couldn't see where he was going. His back hit the wall and he slid down to the damp floor. Don't be afraid, a child's voice whispered in his ear. Leave me alone, James cried, swinging his arms wildly. Laughter echoed around him, children's laughter, but distorted, sinister. He crawled along the floor, desperate to find an exit. His hand touched something cold and metallic a door handle. He yanked it open and tumbled through, landing on wet grass. He was outside, in a park shrouded in mist. The moon hung low in the sky, casting an eerie glow. James scrambled to his feet. The park was unfamiliar, the silhouettes of leafless trees like gnarled hands reaching toward the heavens. Which way? he whispered, spinning in circles. A shadow moved at the edge of his vision. He ran. Branches snagged at his clothes as he tore through the underbrush. The ground was uneven and several times he nearly fell. Behind him the whispers and laughter persisted, growing closer. He burst into a clearing where an old playground stood in decay. Rusted swings creaked in the wind, and a dilapidated carousel sat motionless. James's chest heaved as he tried to catch his breath. You can't escape. Multiple voices whispered in unison. He spotted a path leading away from the playground and sprinted toward it. His injured ankle protested with sharp pain, but adrenaline pushed him onward. The path twisted and turned, leading deeper into the woods. The trees closed in overhead, blocking out the moonlight. He emerged onto a familiar street. His street. Relief flooded him as he recognized his house at the far end. Almost there. He limped toward it, each step agony. A figure stepped out from behind a parked car. The clown. James froze. The child stood between him and his home, head tilted, that perpetual grin fixed in place. Why are you doing this? James shouted, tears streaming down his face. The clown raised an arm, pointing a long clawed finger at him. Trick or treat, the child said in a voice that echoed unnaturally. James's mind raced. Treat, treat, I choose treat. The clown shook its head slowly. Too late. The other children emerged from the shadows surrounding him. Their faces were gaunt, eyes hollow. They advanced slowly, a circle tightening around him. James backed away until he felt the cold metal of a fence behind him. Please, he begged. I just want to go home. Home, the children whispered. They reached out with pale, withered hands. In a final act of desperation, James grabbed the plastic sword and swung it wildly. The children recoiled slightly, but then continued forward, unfazed. He closed his eyes, bracing for the inevitable. A blinding light suddenly illuminated the street. Hey, what's going on over there? A deep voice called out. James opened his eyes to see a police car stopped nearby, its headlights cutting through the darkness. The children were gone. An officer approached him cautiously. Sir, are you all right? James nodded weakly. I... I don't know. 
You look like you've seen a ghost, the officer remarked. Do you need medical assistance? James shook his head. No, I just need to get home. Do you live nearby? Yes, just down the street. I'll walk you, the officer offered. As they made their way to James's house, he glanced around nervously. The street was quiet. The houses dark. You shouldn't be out alone this late, the officer said. Lots of strange folks about on Halloween. Tell me about it, James muttered. They reached his front door. James fumbled with his keys, his hands trembling. Are you sure you're okay? The officer asked. Yeah, thank you. Good night, then. Stay safe. James entered his house, locking the door behind him. He leaned against it, closing his eyes. Safe at last, he whispered. He turned on the lights, the familiar surroundings bringing some comfort. He headed to the kitchen to get a drink of water. As he reached for a glass, he noticed muddy footprints on the floor. His heart sank. The footprints were small, like those of a child. He followed them slowly, leading from the back door, which was ajar, into the living room. The television flickered on by itself, static filling the screen. James's breath caught in his throat. A voice came from behind him, a child's voice, trick or treat. He spun around. The clown stood in the doorway, flanked by the other children. Their eyes glowed with an otherworldly light. This isn't happening, James whispered. They advanced toward him. He backed away, hitting the coffee table and stumbling. Join us, they chanted. James scrambled to his feet, running toward the stairs. He could hear them following, their footsteps unnaturally loud on the wooden floor. He raced up to his bedroom, slamming the door shut and pushing a dresser in front of it. Silence. He backed away from the door, eyes fixed on the doorknob. It began to turn slowly. The door shook as something, or many somethings, pushed against it. Leave me alone, James screamed. The pounding intensified. He looked around desperately for an escape. The window. He threw it open and looked down. It was a two-story drop. Behind him, the door began to splinter. With no time to hesitate, James climbed onto the windowsill and jumped. He landed hard on the bushes below, pain exploding in his leg. He cried out but forced himself to move. He limped away from the house, heading down the street once more. The neighborhood was distorted now, houses appearing warped, the sky a swirl of dark clouds. He realized with dawning horror that he was trapped. There's nowhere to run. The voices whispered on the wind. James collapsed onto the sidewalk, tears streaming down his face. What do you want from me? A hand rested gently on his shoulder. He looked up to see the clown, but the face was softer now, almost sympathetic. Join us, the child said softly. Why me? James asked, his voice barely a whisper. You looked at us, the clown replied. Most people don't see. James remembered the moment he had first spoken to the child on Maple Street. Is that all? The clown nodded. Now you belong with us. James shook his head. I don't want to. You have no choice. The other children gathered around him, their faces expectant. James felt a strange calm wash over him. His resistance faded, replaced by a numb acceptance. Will it hurt? he asked. The clown smiled gently. Not for long. They reached out, their hands cold but not unkind. As they touched him, James felt himself slipping away, his surroundings fading into darkness. Somewhere in the distance he heard sirens wailing, voices shouting his name. But it was too late. He was one of them now. The following morning the neighborhood was abuzz with news of a missing man. James's friends and family searched desperately, but no trace of him was ever found. Every Halloween thereafter... Some claimed to see a new figure among the group of ghostly children, a man in a pirate costume, his eyes as hollow as the rest. And if you walk the streets alone on Halloween night, you might hear a faint whisper carried on the wind. Trick or treat. Night of Terror The night was dark, darker than usual. The sky was a void with only the faintest hints of stars hidden by thick clouds that drifted across the vast expanse above. As the miles ticked by, the landscape seemed to blend together, 
each mile indistinguishable from the last. Trees lined the road, shadows stretching long and thin across the pavement, and the only company I had was the steady hum of the car and the occasional rumble of thunder in the distance. It was strange, thinking back. I couldn't even remember the last gas station I'd passed, and every sign I had seen was either rusted over or so faded that the letters were barely legible. But that didn't matter to me at the time. I'd been on the road for hours, traveling for work, heading to a town I'd only seen on a map, a little speck in the middle of a forgotten part of the country. It was one of those places that didn't seem real until you were actually there. But right now, I was alone, just me and the road. I glanced at the dashboard clock. Nearly midnight. A yawn escaped me and I blinked, trying to focus on the narrow stretch of road illuminated by my headlights. The world around me was silent, unsettlingly so. Every few minutes I'd turn the radio on, hoping for some local station to crackle through the static. But there was nothing, only the hiss of empty air. I switched it off, resigning myself to the quiet. It was as I rounded a bend that I noticed the lights. Two pinpricks in the distance, tiny glows of orange against the darkness. I squinted, watching as they drew closer, two headlights cutting through the night. I thought nothing of it at first. Just another car, someone else out on the road. But as the minutes passed, the headlights stayed fixed in my mirror, growing larger, closer. I kept my speed steady, waiting for them to pass, but they didn't. They matched my speed. I frowned, glancing at the rearview mirror more frequently now. My car hummed steadily beneath me, the vibration steady and even. But my heartbeat was another story. A flicker of unease twisted in my chest, and I gripped the steering wheel a little tighter. I sped up just a bit. The car behind me did the same, so I slowed down, waiting for them to pass. But again, they matched me, their headlights hovering at the exact same distance, like a shadow lurking just behind. After another mile, my heart started to pound harder. I told myself it was nothing, just another traveler, maybe someone heading in the same direction. Maybe they didn't want to be alone on the road either. I tried to calm myself, to keep my breathing even, but it was hard to ignore the prickle of fear creeping up my spine. The road stretched endlessly ahead a narrow two-lane highway that wound through thick forests and desolate fields. There wasn't a single house or street lamp in sight, just the yawning darkness, interrupted only by the occasional flicker of lightning in the distance. And still the car followed. Another mile passed. I glanced at the clock again, only to find that barely five minutes had gone by. I tried to focus on the road to keep my eyes ahead but my gaze kept drifting to the rearview mirror, to the headlights that seemed to glow a little too brightly in the darkness. Finally, I spotted a rest area sign up ahead. A sense of relief washed over me. Maybe if I pulled in, they'd keep going, and this would all be over. I flicked on my turn signal, slowed down, and turned off the highway, pulling into the small, deserted lot. I didn't look in the mirror, not right away. I parked, took a breath, and waited my hands trembling slightly as I gripped the steering wheel. After a few seconds, I glanced up. The car had followed me off the road. It was parked a few spaces down, headlights still on, engine idling. I couldn't see inside. The windows were tinted and the darkness swallowed everything else. The unease I'd felt before was now a tight, cold knot in my chest. I forced myself to breathe, to act natural. I told myself I was just being paranoid, that it was nothing, just a coincidence. I climbed out of the car, stretched my legs, and walked over to the vending machine, my steps echoing in the silence. I put in some change, punched in the buttons for a bottle of water and waited for it to clatter down. As I reached for it, I glanced back at the car, hoping, no, praying that whoever was inside would get out that maybe they were just another weary traveler in need of a break. But no one got out. The car sat there, unmoving, headlights cutting across the pavement, casting long shadows that seemed to stretch toward me. I shivered, more from the fear than the cold, and turned back to my car, forcing myself to walk calmly, to act like nothing was wrong. I climbed in, shut the door and started the engine, my heart pounding in my chest. 
The headlights from the other car stayed fixed on me as I pulled out of the parking lot, back onto the highway. For a moment I thought it was over, that they'd stay behind. But then I glanced in the mirror, and there they were, following me, those same two lights glowing ominously in the darkness. I sped up, hoping to put some distance between us, but the car matched me. No matter how fast I went, how many turns I took, those headlights stayed glued to my bumper. I couldn't shake them. It was as if they were tethered to me, like some spectral presence haunting me from the shadows. An hour passed, maybe more. Time seemed to blur, the road stretching endlessly ahead, my hands slick with sweat as I gripped the steering wheel. My mind raced, thoughts spinning out of control. Why were they following me? What did they want? I tried everything to lose them. I weaved between lanes, took sharp turns, even slowed down to almost a crawl, hoping they'd grow frustrated and pass. But nothing worked. The car followed every move I made, relentless, like a predator toying with its prey. I could feel my heartbeat pounding in my ears, each beat louder than the last, each one ratcheting up my fear. The road was an endless stretch of nothingness, a thin ribbon of concrete winding through fields and forests that offered no signs of civilization, no places to stop, no other lights but the pair that clung to my tail. I told myself it was just someone who happened to be going the same way. But each time I glanced in the mirror, those headlights seemed closer, like they were creeping up on me inch by inch, waiting for the perfect moment. A few more miles passed, and then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a glint. A gas station sign flickering in the distance, barely visible against the dark stretch of sky. Relief flooded through me. I could pull in, maybe talk to someone, find some comfort in the presence of another human being. I flicked my blinker on and took the exit, heart hammering as I watched the car in my mirror. Surely they'd keep going. I couldn't shake the hope that this time, finally, they'd leave me alone. But as I pulled into the gas station, the car followed, its headlights illuminating the empty parking lot. I pulled up to the pump, barely noticing that the place seemed deserted. My eyes were glued to the mirror as the car rolled in, coming to a stop a few spaces away. The gas station was old, almost abandoned-looking, with dim lights that barely cut through the darkness. The sign above the station flickered weakly, casting eerie shadows on the cracked pavement. I glanced around, hoping to see a clerk inside, maybe another traveler, anyone. But there was no one. Just me, the hum of my engine and the unsettling silence. I sat there for a moment, gathering my courage, and then finally stepped out, glancing back at the car. I couldn't see the driver. Its windows were tinted, pitch black, reflecting the weak light from the station's sign. But I could feel it, that heavy, ominous presence watching me, waiting for something. I walked to the pump, trying to keep my movements calm, casual. I told myself they were just another traveler, just someone who had no idea they were freaking me out. I fumbled with the nozzle trying to keep my eyes on the pump, but I couldn't help it. My gaze drifted back to the car. Still, no one got out. The engine was running, a low, steady rumble that seemed almost alive. I swallowed, feeling a chill creep over my skin, as if the night air had dropped several degrees in an instant. I finished pumping the gas, forced myself to take a deep breath, and headed toward the small convenience store. The door chimed as I walked in, and I saw a lone attendant standing behind the counter, a young guy in his twenties with his head buried in his phone. He looked up as I approached, gave me a brief nod, then went back to his screen. Busy night? I asked, my voice strained, trying to sound casual. My eyes kept darting to the window, to the faint outline of the car in the parking lot. The attendant shrugged, barely looking up. Not really. Quiet, like always. I nodded forcing a smile. You ever see people, uh, hanging around here, late at night? I glanced out the window again, feeling that familiar prick of fear clawing at me. The attendant's eyes flicked up, following my gaze. Sometimes, weird stuff happens on the highway, he muttered, his tone casual but carrying a hint of something darker. His words only made my stomach churn. I grabbed a bottle of water, 
hoping to steady my nerves and paid for it quickly, thanking him in a voice that shook slightly. I turned back to the window, half expecting to see the car gone, but it was still there, parked exactly where it had been. The headlights were off now, but I could still make out its dark shape, the faint glint of moonlight on the tinted windows. Stealing myself, I walked out of the store, feeling the weight of the silence settle over me once again. I made my way back to my car, trying to act normal, trying to ignore the prickling sensation at the back of my neck. But just as I reached for the handle, I noticed something strange. The driver's side door of the other car was cracked open, just slightly. I froze, my hand hovering over the door handle, heart hammering in my chest. There was no movement, no sound, but the sight of that open door sent a fresh wave of fear through me. It was as if the car itself was waiting for something, or someone. I quickly yanked my door open, slipped inside and locked it, fingers shaking as I fumbled to start the engine. My eyes kept darting to the other car, watching, waiting for any sign of movement. But nothing happened. The door stayed slightly ajar, the interior cloaked in darkness, as if it were inviting me to come closer. Without waiting another second, I threw the car into gear and peeled out of the lot, tires squealing as I sped back onto the highway. I glanced in the mirror, breath held tight in my chest, praying I wouldn't see them follow. For a moment, there was nothing, just the empty road stretching out behind me, dark and silent. But then, out of the shadows, those same headlights appeared once more, flickering to life like the eyes of some predatory creature. They were closer this time, closer than they had been before. Panic surged through me and I pressed my foot down on the accelerator, feeling the car lurch forward as I tried to outrun them. I weaved between lanes, took sharp turns, did everything I could to lose them. But the headlights stayed with me, growing brighter, closer, their glow filling my rearview mirror, casting an eerie light over the inside of the car. I glanced at the clock. Only a few minutes had passed, but it felt like hours, each second stretching out as my heart raced and my breath came in short, ragged gasps. My hands were slick with sweat as I gripped the steering wheel, white-knuckled, feeling trapped, hunted. The road seemed to stretch on forever, an endless empty ribbon winding through the darkness. I pushed the car harder, the engine roaring as I forced it to its limit. But no matter how fast I went, no matter how many turns I took, those headlights stayed right behind me, following every move with a quiet, patient persistence. I didn't know what they wanted. I didn't know who was behind those tinted windows or why they were following me. All I knew was that I couldn't escape, that no matter how hard I tried, they were always there, lurking in the shadows, waiting. After what felt like an eternity, I spotted a faint glow in the distance, a town maybe or a rest stop. I pushed the car even harder, feeling a desperate, almost frantic hope flare in my chest. If I could just reach that light, if I could just make it to where there were people, maybe I'd be safe. But the closer I got, the more the lights behind me seemed to close in, their beams casting long eerie shadows across the road. I could almost feel them breathing down my neck, feel the weight of their gaze pressing down on me, as if they were savoring every moment, relishing my fear. Finally I reached the lights, the faint glow revealing a small deserted gas station at the edge of town. I pulled in, skidding to a stop under the harsh fluorescent lights, heart pounding as I looked back, half expecting the car to pull in after me. But this time it didn't. The car sped past the station, its taillights fading into the darkness as it disappeared down the road. I sat there for a long moment, breathing hard, trying to calm the adrenaline still coursing through my veins. I was safe. The car was gone, but even now as I sit here, my hands still trembling, I can't shake the feeling that it's not over, that somewhere, out on the road, they're still there, waiting, watching just beyond the reach of the headlights.